get started. So good afternoon, everyone, and welcome. My name is John Squadro, and this is Catherine Nye. Hello, everyone. We are both physical therapists. We're visiting Nurse Service of New York in the Care 360 organization. We will be discussing falls and falls prevention. The presentation is titled Preventing Falls Among Seniors, Tips and Techniques for Keeping New York's Elderly Strong on Their Feet. And if anyone does have any questions um, during the presentation, they can use the chat to ask questions. And at the end of the presentation, we will have some time for uh, questions and answers. So a fall can be a very common experience. Um, so has anyone here had a fall in the last year? Has a family member fallen in the last year? Do you know anyone who fell in the past three months? Has anyone here lost their balance recently? Has anyone here tripped while walking? Has anyone here bumped into something? If you answer yes to any of these questions, you or a loved one could be at risk for a fall. So a little perspective on falls. Um, one in four older adults will suffer a fall, suffer a serious fall this year. 70% of these falls occur in the home. Falls increase with age. So one in two adults 85 or older will fall. Falls are the leading cause of fatal and non-fatal injury in older adults. Every 17 seconds, an elderly person is taken to the ER because of a fall. And one in five falls cause a serious injury, such as a broken bone or a head injury. So what is a fall? A fall is defined as an event whereby an individual unexpectedly comes to rest on the ground or another lower level without known loss of consciousness. Some risk factors for falls can be if you're taking multiple medications, if you have an extensive medical history and fall history, environmental safety, within the home or outside your home, vision deficits, muscle weakness, and balance and mobility problems. So what puts you at risk for a fall? So some personal factors, like we discussed in the previous slide, could include weakness in the legs, a previous history of falling, walking and balance problems, vision problems, depression, cognitive impairment, dizziness, urinary incontinence. Females have a greater risk for a fall than men and being over the age of 80. So some external factors that may put you at risk for a fall. So taking four or more medications, loose rugs or carpets in the home, improper footwear, hurrying or rushing to and from a, um, to a, a different rooms, using ambulatory aids incorrectly, electrical cords that are on the floor, if you have poor lighting, in hallways or rooms, stairs, clutter in the home, and wet surfaces. So medication risks. So symptoms and side effects related to falls. Medications do have side effects and can interact with each other if you're taking multiple medications. So some of these side effects related to a fall could include dizziness, drowsiness, blurred vision, feeling faint, feeling unsteady, and confusion. So adding new medications or changing dosages 
may increase your risk for a fall. Some medication management tips. You want to review your drugs with your doctor and your pharmacist for drug interactions. You always want to carry a list of your medications with you. Remember to take medications as prescribed and do not share or borrow medications. Know the common side effects for each drug that you are taking and ask for the lowest possible dose. Ask your doctor before taking any herbal or over-the-counter drugs. So vision, vision can play a role in having a risk for a fall. So how's your eyesight? It's strongly recommended that you go for a, at least one eye exam per year. Older adults may also have medication, medical conditions that affect vision such as cataracts, glaucoma, macular degeneration, or diabetic retinopathy. So some vision impairment tips. Use magnifiers when reading. Improve home lighting for brightness and in different locations that you frequently walk. Bright and contrasting colors can help. Request large print on your medicine bottles. Use timers, audio, and voice alarms or reminder systems to take your medication. Scan your environment before moving around. Avoid the use of multifocal lenses and glasses when walking on stairs if possible. It's recommended single focal lenses be used. So staying safe in the home. It's important to use a home safety assessment checklist to review all rooms in the home. These safety checklists will include bathroom safety, bedroom safety, kitchen safety, floor safety, stairs and steps safety. We've included a link to the CDC website that takes you right to their um, home safety brochure that you can download. Staying safe wherever you are. So in the home, you'd like to remove clutter on the floor. You want to fix uneven surfaces that may cause a, tr a trip and a fall. You want to take down, tape down rugs, cords, or move them to be safer. Arrange furniture to widen pathways to walk. Keep commonly used items in easy to reach places, especially in the bedroom and the bathroom. Look at the bed and chair heights, so getting up or down is easier and safer. And do not use step stools to reach items. Staying safe wherever you are. So think ahead about access when using a cane, walker, or chair. Use handrails on stairs. Avoid any wet floors and wipe up spills right away. Be sure chairs and other furniture are stable and check for adequate lighting. Consider using grab bars, raised toilet seats, non-skid tub mats, and tub seats in the bathroom. Carry a cell phone or portable phone for easy access. And if you have an emergency response unit like a life alert, make sure you have it with you at all times. So now, Catherine Nye will be continuing. Thank you, John. John has given us many helpful hints and tips and provided some areas that should, we should be looking at in order to prevent falls. I will be going over some more areas that are important in preventing falls. They are balance, mobility, and strength. First, balance. Balance is complex. Several body systems work together for balance. They include your visual system, your vestibular system. This is your inner ear. Uh, it sends signals to your brain regarding your movement. And last is a system involved with sensation and detecting movement 
on your skin, muscles, and joints. Next, we have mobility. Uh, John, could you? Yeah. Mobility. Um, this is how we use movement. This is more than just walking and muscle strength. This is needed for balance and mobility to be effective. Next slide, please. Mobility is more than just walking. To move or walk safely, we need to first control the sense of gravity and shift weight. So as we're walking, uh, as we advance one leg to the and then the other and then the other, we're shifting our weight. Control sway in sitting and standing. That means we need to be able to uh, control the amount of movement while we're sitting or standing. And we complete a sequence of movements uh, while we're walking. When we're walking, um, as we advance, say the right leg, we advance our opposite arm at the same time, what we call arm swing. And then as we advance the other arm, I mean the other leg, the other arm uh, moves as well. So there's the arm swing and the leg movements. And these are a sequence of movements that occur. Next things that can lead to mobility problems. Distractions, they can be visual or auditory distractions. That could be a sudden siren that uh, goes off or the television that's on all the time. Vision limitations, cognition issues, that could be being forgetful, confused, or having learning difficulties. Problems with balance, physical weakness, especially in your legs and arms. It also can include weakness in your trunk, and that would include your stomach muscles and your back muscles. And using the wrong mobility aid or device, that would be using the wrong assistive device, such as using a cane instead of a walker. Next is balance, mobility, and strength factors seen in falls. These are things we may see in those with a risk for falls. They can include decreased flexibility in your lower leg joints and muscles, decreased muscle strength, in particular around the ankles, knees, and hips, slow walking speed, a tendency to take smaller steps, decreased balance, decreased coordination, decreased reflexes and longer reaction times. As we age, our reaction time slows down. If, for instance, you stub your toe or stumble and you're unable to react quickly enough to maintain your balance, it puts you at a greater risk of falls. Changes in vision and sensation. Uh, vision and sensation are components in maintaining balance. And last, decreased activity. Next slide, please. You may now be asking, how can I improve my balance and mobility? So some examples of activities to help are balance training programs. As a physical therapist, uh, very commonly we uh, treat patients uh, and work on balance training programs. Uh, in the balance training programs, we include balance activities. These are activities that challenge your balance and um, kind of uh, uh, challenge you to you know move and and move outside of your um, base of support which is outside of just your area where your feet are standing and also muscle strengthening and flexibility exercises so these are all components that as a physical therapist we do work on in a balance training program there are also walking programs tai chi uh, this includes slow focused movements which work on shifting your weight for balance and working your muscles by maintaining the stability and controlling your movements. Yoga, uh, yoga includes a lot of stretching, but also um, strengthening and stability in order to maintain those postures and uh, movements. Aerobic exercises, they can include swimming, stationary bicycling, and also walking programs are part of aerobic exercises. Exercise programs. You are never too old to exercise. Exercises have been shown to help. They've been shown to help reduce the fear of falling, improve flexibility, strength, and endurance, improve cardiovascular health. That's your heart. Help decrease depression. Uh, when we exercise, we release endorphins. These are the feel-good hormones. It helps elimination, digestion, and other processes. Reduce sleep disorders. Sometimes after a good exercise, uh, working out, we may uh, find that we sleep better. And skeletal muscle sensitivity to insulin action. 
for those with diabetes, exercise can improve your body's sensitivity to insulin and insulin regulates your blood sugar levels. And remember that exercises can be done alone or in a group. Sometimes uh, exercising in a group may be a little bit more motivating, a little more fun. I find that, um, I personally find exercising in a group, taking classes a little bit um, more exciting sometimes. Um, I know as a, uh, uh, in the, for seniors, they have a silver sneaker program. It, it's basically an exercise program designed for seniors and sometimes uh, your local YMCA or senior center may um, host some of these programs. And next is the ambulatory aids and footwear tips. Ambulatory aids are the assistive devices that we use when we walk. So they could include your cane, your walker, your crutches. So ambulatory aids, they should be fitted for each person's height and needs. This can be done by a physical therapist, uh, should be used correctly. Also, this is um, done by a physical therapist. Check parts that open and close. Check for worn down tips and make sure um, it is steady, not wobbly. What can happen is sometimes at the bottom of your cane or walker, the rubber tips can get worn down where they are not quite as making the cane or walker not as level. So what you can do is you can actually change out these tips, these rubber tips, so that way it's more steady. Older adults should have safe footwear. Always wear shoes, and that's indoors and outdoors. Regular socks alone are unsafe. I can tell you personally, I once fell, this just this winter, I was wearing these uh, booty type uh, booty type socks, you know, the thick ones um, that keep you warm. They had the rubber sole bottom, so I thought that it would be safe. Um, I was um, rushing, of course. I was rushing down my wooden floor stairs, um, walking down, and first step down, my foot went right from under me, slip, and then boom, 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 down the whole entire hardwood floor stairs. I was holding, I was holding on to the handrail. I only have one handrail, so one side. And I was trying to, you know, control the fall, holding on, trying, trying, but uh, it didn't work until I landed at the very end of my um, staircase. I luckily I didn't break anything, but I really was very black and blue all the way on my hip, my leg, my knee, um, and then it ended up being I was just in pain, honestly, all over the next day from the arm, shoulder, trying to hold on and trying to brace myself from the fall. I went all the way up into my neck because I must have pulled something there as well because I was straining as I was tumbling down all you know fifteen stairs stairs. So um, even myself, and I am, you know, I am relatively healthy. Um, I exercise regularly. I don't have any you know, balance or uh, problems. But even myself, I really did injure myself. And I was really, um, I still had soreness and pain, honestly, for months still in my leg. And I remember it was tender to touch, even, and my wrist also tender to touch, even to like push off getting up from a chair. So Something like this, uh, falls can really uh, put a, do a number on anybody. So I always now, I know that to make sure I, I'm not wearing socks in the house, especially those booties. And next um, are the safe shoes. You want them to have non-skid soles, cover your toes and heels, and you want them to stay in your feet, fitting your toes and heels well. So that means no sandals or flip-flops. And then for the heel heights, they should be flat or less than two inches, no big heel. Next is a cycle of fear. Fear can create a vicious cycle leading to increased risk of falls. Beginning here on the bottom left corner of the slide, fear of falling begins. This may follow a fall or near fall. And then this can lead to self-limited daily activities and or mobility tasks. Then, which can lead to decreased activity levels, which leads to muscle weakness, inflexibility, and poor endurance. This then leads to increased difficulty with mobility, which leads to possible falls, and then more fear and anxiety. Then it repeats, leading to increase, further increased risk for falls. 
Next is what to do if a fall happens. First, remember to stay calm, of course. If you're hurt, put your emergency plan into place. If you don't feel strong enough to get up yourself without further injury, stay in place and call for help. If you're not hurt badly and you're comfortable with trying to get up, you can attempt to get up from the fall. First, you would roll onto your side, find a sturdy piece of furniture that could be a stable chair, kitchen table, or countertop, and crawl or roll over to it. Now, from a kneeling position, put your arms up onto the stable surface, put one foot flat on the floor, and at the same time, push down using your arms onto the stable surface. So basically, you're using the strength from your legs and your arms to help um, bring yourself up. Then you're going to find a chair to sit down and rest. Now, these are some real life scenarios and some tips. First here on the left side is a picture of a rollator. So when you're using a rollator, you wanna make sure you have both hands on the walker and, to be, and be able to use the brakes. The brakes are here on the handles and they are like bike brakes. Next, for those with pets, darting pets and their leashes can wrap around your legs. So you wanna make sure you keep your leashes away from the floor and the darting pets in their designated areas, especially when you know you're gonna be getting up and walking. And the next here um, on the picture on the right-hand side is um, if you're using a cane and you find that you need to hold onto someone still, you may need a more supportive ambulatory aid. So essentially, if you're using an um, assistive device, such as a cane or a walker, and you find that you still need to hold on to someone, that may be indicative that you may need to change and use a more supportive ambulatory aid. Here are some more of your life scenarios. Here on the left-hand side is a picture of overgrown, unsteady, unlevel stairs with leaves, grasses, and weeds. These leaves, grasses, and weeds are more likely to be slippery and they can increase your fall risk. Also, stairs that are any surface that you're walking on that's unlevel like these, that can also be a uh, fall risk. Next here, the picture with the cobblestone sidewalks and driveways. And if you look here, you can see that there's cracks in the road, which are kind of common here around New York. And also that the, um, curb here is not really level. So you want to be careful here because these, these areas can be potential uh, fall risk areas. And you want to be sure not to catch your toe when stepping. And also remember that the surface can be very slippery when wet. Next here is don't let falls trip you up. A quick review of some main points that John and I have discussed today. Our falls are common among seniors and can be common even among those who are not seniors. You want to know your risk factors. Um, we had mentioned um, them. They include multiple medications, uh, medical and falls history, having decreased balance and mobility, mobility, muscle weakness, vision issues, environmental safety issues, and personal and external factors, whether they are uh, your home environment or personal um, factors that you may have, such as fear. Now, how can you stay strong on your feet? A review, um, check your medications, talk to your doctor about lower doses and side effects. Always wear shoes indoors and outside. Have your vision checked. It should be checked annually. Work on improving your strength, balance, and mobility. That can be done through exercising on a regular basis. Keep your checklist handy. Uh, these checklists are the ones that John had mentioned on the CDC, that's the Center for Disease Control website. It actually has um, various checklists and it's actually very helpful. It has a lot of the um, uh, tips, include some of the tips and hints that um, John and I have discussed already, but includes areas that you should be looking at in your home to prevent falls. And of course, assess your home for safety. Next slide, please. Where can you find help? There are various agencies in your in the community that can that where you can find to 
find exercise programs to help with your balance. Uh, for instance, uh, your local senior service center or your YMCA or yoga studio, they may have programs, some programs designed just for seniors even to help uh, get you on an exercise program. The uh, APTA here on the center, that's the American Physical Therapy Association. Uh, on that website, you can find a uh, licensed physical therapist in your area if you need to get started on a balance program or they can set you up on a appropriate, safe uh, exercise program. Also, it mentioned the CDC, that's the Center for Disease Control that we had mentioned. They have, um, not only do they have the checklist for your home that John and I mentioned, but also it has a lot of just general tips, facts about falls and how falls can be very serious and create a lot of uh, very serious problems um, and, and fractures for um, seniors. Now, any questions, anybody? That concludes our presentation. Does anyone have any questions? We'll give you a couple of minutes just in case. I see that Veronica had answered Lorraine that a recording of the presentation will be available afterwards, so. Wonderful. Oh, I see a question here. I'm just looking here at the chat. I wasn't able to look at the chat while I was presenting. How are your legs doing after the fall? <laughs> well, it was actually in the winter. So it's we've had like a good like nine nine months since, I think. Um, my the, the tenderness actually just went away sometime in the summer. And that is, I don't wanna, you know, and I'm not really a person who, focuses on the pain and you know I'm like oh but then I remember like one day I mean I I, I actually um uh must have injured my wrist also I guess when I tried to when I fell ultimately so my wrist I know I kept remembering that that was even sore to push up on like on the bed or something and that was for months and months and months and then and that wasn't even like visibly bruised and then my leg which was very black and blue to the point where I go oh my goodness this is like horrible looking um, that was tender to touch, honestly, into the summer as well. I mean, I, that wasn't something that was I was reminded of as regularly because I guess, you know, I don't really, nothing rushes up against my leg as often. But um, finally, but finally now, um, it's not tender to touch. Um, my knee is still a little funny, but that was my bad knee. So, but the point of this was that, you know, something like that, I mean, though I didn't break anything, um, it's it was problematic for like, months and months. But thank you for asking, I appreciate that. And the next question from Johanna, Triana, um, what's the process for a patient to enroll in one of these programs you mentioned? So um, like the program that Catherine had mentioned, the Silver Sneakers, they are sponsored by many um, insurance companies, Silver Sneakers, so you can contact your insurance company to see um, if they are participating in this program because they do um they will also subsidize sometimes for the cost of the program so you can call and find out um who is providing this program in your area in the local area that you may live in and if um and if this program is subsidized by your insurance company also, John, to add, um, I know Silver Sneakers actually has a website because I was on that uh -huh. um, when I was researching this. And I know that you can search for area Silver Sneaker programs in your area. So I would try um, also looking up just Silver Sneakers. You can Google that and then you'll find their website and then you'll be able to find, hopefully locate something right by you. Okay. And I see Natasha had a question. What is a good time to get an alert bracelet? Um, listen, I think the time is before you actually need it, <laughs> to, to be honest with you. Um, if, if you're in a good position and, and you're, um, your insurance, sometimes the insurance companies will cover the cost of it. 
but if you see that you're starting to need assistance to get up from a chair or assistance to walk from place to place, it may be a good time to get one of these alert bracelets because you may be at risk for a fall at that point. So when you start to see some signs that it's difficult for you to transition from chairs to standing or when when walking a certain distance it becomes painful or, or or you need to rest these that's a good indication that a bracelet may be um may be good for you i hope that answers your question i see todd had a question as well um in terms of a cane is there a good point of reference to help adjust how high or low or short it should be. Well, the point of reference is 30 degrees of bend at the elbow and the, the, the top of the cane should be at what they call the greater trochanter of your hip, which um, is the bony prominence on, on the side of your hip. So that, that's really the point of reference when adjusting a cane. Sure, you're welcome. Okay. Hmm. I think that's all of the questions in the chat okay. for now. So you can see we've included um, some of the sources that we utilize to gather some of the information in, in this presentation. So when it's sent out to you, you can um, utilize any of these sources to get, you know, any of the checklists or um, some additional information as far as falls um, data and, and research as, as well as um, some recommendations for, uh, for exercise. So just a little bit about visiting nurse service um, in general before we finish. Um, VNSNY is New York City's largest not-for-profit home and community-based healthcare organization. Our mission is to improve the health and well-being of people through high-quality, cost-effective healthcare in the home and community provide care to 44,300 patients and health plan members daily. Community outreach programs serve various populations, including veterans, Chinatown Community Center Hospice Outreach Patient and Provider Education, HOPE, and New York, New York's LGBT seniors. And again, to learn more about VNSNY, you can visit our website and you can scan this QR code, um, which, will, which should lead you to the website. So thank you everybody for joining us. Um, we really appreciate your time. And as Veronica said, this presentation will be going out to anybody who requests it. Yes, thank you everyone for joining. We do really appreciate you uh, coming out to um, uh, listen to us and to um, hear us today. Thank you. Thank you so much, everyone.